Well, I'm going to ask these two incredible gentlemen some questions, and we're going to leave some time for you to ask some questions. And um, we'll just take it from there. Um, this was my second time seeing the movie, and I have to say, um, it was even more powerful the second time around. Uh, I think there's so much in there. I mean, I almost could see it a third time. You know, so many people and so many people who I personally knew, although Halston, I did not know. Um, but it really captured a time in our history, in the fashion industry, in the, in the world, the whole AIDS um, time. It's just, it's really, I'm, I'm very pleased at how, how good it came out, actually. So, Stan, tell me what you thought of the movie. Well, I was profoundly moved. I had never seen it before. And I'm one of those ancient mariners that goes way back with Halston. I started about the same time. He's about my age, a little younger. Uh, I knew him. I worked with him, not in the office, but I worked with him within the confines of what we call the campus of 7th Avenue. Uh, it was a shock for me today to see the profound simplicity of our, of our world at that time, when big business first really raised its ugly head and designers suddenly started to make monster fortunes and lost their name for doing such. Halston was not the only one who did it. So I, I, I found this, and seeing all those people, Tom, all the people that I grew up with are in that film, yes. all the models that, that Pat and uh, Karen, all, all of them, uh, to see Liza. This is probably for me the best film I've seen of a designer of my time. Well, great. And I've got some good stories to tell you later. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to them. <laughs> and, uh, Fred, I will. <laughs> Fred, tell, how do you feel about the movie? At first, the first time I saw it, I was a little, I wasn't sure because I'm an insider. But after seeing it the second time and then the third time, I have to say that it's a terrific movie because it really gives the information to an audience who wasn't, weren't insiders and that it really, it really gives you a narrative and it really gives you a, a feeling of the time that it happened. It's got the glamour and the glitz, but it's got the reality of yeah. the, right. the son of a bitch is in business right. and what that's all about. Right, right. So right. tell us what your role was as the studio manager right. or what did, what you, was what your did role? you do? <laughs> I want to know what your role was, <laughs> yes. So I was hired to help in the workroom and I got it. I, I was hired for three weeks. We need somebody for three weeks. Great. And this what, was at Olympic Tower? This was at Olympic Tower in 1978. So I figured I'm in the center of the world. I'm not leaving this place. So I had to figure out how to stay. So I, I saw that the patterns were all over the place and Holston was always upset. Why don't you have this? Why do you have that? So I created a pattern library when I, when I started. So I stayed and stayed and stayed. And then I became the supervisor of the workroom, meaning uh, the, the assistants would call, uh, send in sketches, Halston starting the collection, sent in sketches. I would oversee it. We'd have a few muslins finished um, or things draped in the fabric and call and say, we're ready to do fittings. And then I would go in and, and follow the fittings and then just follow up on timing and, and things getting done, and if there were mistakes or problems or whatever. So like a production manager, in a sense. Right, for the, for the uh, samples, for okay. all the collections, exactly. And then I did special projects. I was always the guy that they went to for special projects within the company. Did, did you go to China on the trip? I did not, thank how, God. How long were you with the company? Three years. Just, just three years? Just under three years, yeah. Uh, did you like Halston? <laughs> <laughs> Did I like Holston? You know, I ended up working there near the, you know, the rough years, and I and I really had no problem with him. I only had one run-in with him through the years that I was there, and I I don't know if I would say I liked him. I didn't like him. He was a rough guy. He was really going through some tough times. I, I could say that I liked him. At the end, you know, after all these years, I liked him, but he, he was so frustrated. 
through those years and he, and he couldn't delegate responsibility and it was so clear to see what was going on. It was so clear. Right. So I think you kind of like him now, but I think right. you probably didn't. Then. I was a kid. I was 22 years old when huh. I started. That there. was. And how did how did, did he treat the people in the in the, in the he studio? He was he was rough. I mean, he was tough. Tough, right? He was tough with Mike Lichtenstein. He really didn't think that he was on his side, or he didn't think he was the right managing director. And unfortunately, as we know, like someone like a Barry and a Calvin that worked like a dream, he didn't have the person. So you didn't think there was anybody there he really trusted? Never. He didn't trust people. He didn't trust people. He trusted himself. I, I, I've always said that. You know, that I've, it, it, most of the great designers get an alter ego in their life. If they don't, there's no longevity there. Uh, I, I just want to tell a story that I think sums up the kind of mindset that Halston has. I think it was in the 80s. I was already a uniform designer, and um, I was doing a United Airlines, and I was asked to, to compete for Pan Am. And uh, I couldn't, so I asked Edith Head, who was a friend of mine, who loved to do uniforms for movies, would she take my place? And she competed against Halston. She worked for one vendor. He worked for the other vendor. Her, ours was Hart Schaffner Marks. I saw the two collections, and Halston's was phenomenal. It was perfectly beautiful. He won. And then the people at Pan Am said, we love what you've done. But it was the time when every, the hems, hemlines dropped. They said, but we can't have women in clothes with such long hemlines. He said, they will stay that way. They will not be lifted at all. This is what I, this is what I, he lost the account. Edith had got the account, it was not very good, she was very proud of it, but he literally lost the account because he believed that those hemlines should stay that way. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's a good and bad thing. It was bad for the poor people who worked for him because he could have made a lot of people quite wealthy, but it, 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 it was just the way he was. I also will tell you one other story. Right. And then, uh, when the pennies, I happen to be very friendly with the lawyers from pennies. And of course, I was on a community board five with, with, with one of them. And she would tell me these stories about Halston and how he was negotiating with pennies. And the, as Irene said it, the thing that broke the camel's back was when pennies saw the limo, the, how much money was being spent on the limo, his coming to work from Fifth Avenue and 50th Street to Sixth Avenue and 50th Street. <laughs> And that broke the back of pennies. They said, that is outrageous. He can't walk? Or True take story. a taxi. What? Or take a taxi. Or take a taxi. Right. So at the end of the day, is the message you have to be frugal and mindful of expenses? <laughs> well, you have to be frugal. <laughs> but, you know, can I say, when you yeah. say that, when you, when you tell that story, about he wanted to leave the hems and that was it. The reality is that he made that company and he broke that company. That's right. When you watch the movie, it kind of shows that Carl was uh, the demon there. Yeah. But the bottom line was that Halston created that company, he had a vision, and he stuck with it, and he stuck with it, and he stuck with it, and it went, and it went, and it went, and then the vision and he stuck with it, and he stuck with it, and he stuck with it. And we know that story over and over again. A visionary who creates this huge, wonderful thing. It's amazing. And then, you know, and then it starts going. I always used to say about Halston, he didn't make enough mistakes in his life. Everything was going well, everything was going well, everything was going well, and then all of a sudden, and he didn't, he didn't know, know cope from his, he didn't learn from his mistakes. You know, I, make I, enough. I, again, I, what struck me again in the film was literally how beautiful his clothes were. Uh, as a designer, uh, we try so hard to, to leave our imprimatur somewhere. And his was so strong, so real. Uh, I do have a story that's a little nasty <laughs> about... Uh, oh, it, 
because very early in our careers, we both had the same editor at Vogue. Her name was Keisha Keeble. You remember Keisha? I don't know anybody know, out there who remembers Keisha. You all know Keisha, Keisha out here? Yeah, well, Keisha Keeble was a goddess. Davis, she was PR a goddess. Firm was named from Keisha. And she came back from Paris one, one season. She was just very young at that point. And she had a little package of clothing in her hand. And she said, these are the most incredible things you've ever seen, Stan. You've got to copy them. They are incredible. And I said, I don't copy anything. Are you crazy? I wouldn't copy anything. She said, what I show, she pulled out of this little bag these knit clothes done by a woman named Sonia Riccio. <laughs> and I said, I can't do that, Keisha. I said, if you don't do it, I'll give it to Halston. And she did. And he used them. Interesting. But he did them beautifully. Beautifully. And also the other thing about the film, the one, Jeffrey, we were talking about it, the one fabric that made his life, really made his business, was ultra suede. Ultra suede, without question. Yeah. But he did do, the knits were very Sonia Riquel inspired. I mean, I, I used to wear his sweaters and knits, the things that I could afford, and they were extraordinary. They, they were. No. All the proportions were very Sonia. Uh, uh, no, no doubt about it, but I have to say, being an insider and watching what he did, he evolutionized slash revolutionized the time. We went from the 60s of goofed up clothes and crazy clothes. I love the 60s, be careful. I do too, be I love careful. them. And I love goofed up clothes. <laughs> but the true, and he did too, when he did Martha Graham and he did all these grand clothes, everybody in the place said, wow, we didn't know that, you know, this, he said, I love this stuff. But he had a vision. He absolutely had a vision, yes. and that's what made Halston, yes. in my opinion, is that he created clothes for modern women, that women were coming into the workplace. It was a sexual revolution, and, and women coming into the workplace, and he did it from A to Z. Everybody had a few things in their collections that were Matt Jersey, or they were this, or they were that, but they were not a full statement, boom. This is what I did believe. I get, did he sketch? Were those his sketches? Yeah. Uh, they were, were those his sketches? On the floor? Were those, or those Joe's sketches? When, when he was no, on the no, table no, no, no. with all the sketches on in front well, of Well, Joe's were the uh, watercolor sketches, the beautiful watercolor. But no, the ones on the floor that were done with the uh, magic marker. Were his? Because, okay. Were his. Were his. And then at one point when Stephen Sprouse was there, Stephen did a lot of... Oh, right. illustration that's right. early on, early on. Well, Stephen wasn't even mentioned in the movie. I know. They were, they were, that's why I didn't like it the first time, because I thought, oh my God, that's missing, and that's missing, and that's missing. But that's from my perspective. But for an audience, this is, this is very impactful, and it's got a lot of information, and they don't well, need they, the stuff that I... There are more Holston biopics coming out. I yes, know I know. So that there's maybe a, all of that will... Right. Stan, I, I think, do you, I, well, you know, you said, and you've met him. Did did yeah. you like him? No. <laughs> he wasn't very nice to me. I uh, I I was hot, a hot designer when, when I first met him. I was four or five years before him. I, my era was the '60s. He really made it in the '70s. Uh, we we shared a two two times. We won Cody's together, and so I got to see him one time. Um, we were all backstage and. One of his problems was the cocaine. I mean, he was later looped on. all the time. Yes, we were all backstage, and, and um, he walked right over to the stage manager's t table, and he ripped up all the, all the stage manager's uh, notes for the, he just threw it up in the air. What year was this? 75, I think, when he won, 75? Yeah, or 76. I, I, yeah. I was just, I, I went trying to find all the stuff, um, it was, that was, uh, I'd never seen anything like that happen before, but he was out of my, his mind. And then, of course, we were being, the award was given by Dina Merrill. Remember, everybody remember Dina Merrill? And he came out, it was Halston, H-A, he was first. He came out and he got very nice applause. And then it was H-E who came out afterwards. And I got all the applause. And Dina Merrill said, who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> and he was furious with me, furious. I should stop talking. I don't know. Well, let's talk about the J.C. Penney deal. I mean, today designers line up to do deals with H and M and Target and everybody. Right. I that's mean, the other side. I mean, was he just ahead of his time in the world? I, just I think couldn't he was. Catch up? Yes. I think he was. Yes. I think he was. He saw the writing on the wall. I mean, he but saw the modern. Did clothing ever sell? Was that successful at no, Penney's? No, not at all. No, no, no. 
successful. Not at all. No. And it was really, you know, I always wondered if it was to save the business or if it was really his inspiration and desire to do it. I was never really sure. Well, to but, save the business in the name, I mean, the, how many designers have come after him trying to design Halston? And there still is Halston now on QVC. QVC does very Ka well with it. With very Cam well. Cameron. Uh, yes. And I have to tell you, the clothes look like Halston. They're, th th that simple, wonderful movement of, clo of, of fabric that he was so good at. Uh, there are a lot of designers. I, I was looking at the way he, they took the patterns apart and you saw these beautiful shapes. Yoli does the same thing today. A the lot patterns of people were do that. extraordinary. Extraordinary. The patterns are brilliant. But Jeffrey, you know how it is easy it is to make a pattern when you cut it. Uh, you cut it and, and you open it up and flatten it out. It looks like it, looks like it belongs to the modern art. Well, those Is patterns it? look like modern yeah. art yeah. in the yeah. FIT archives. They were brilliant. Those patterns that were in the movie are from the book we did. It's great. And they took, yeah. So uh, really, it's, you know, it's fascinating. And how important were the collaborations with Elsa Peretti and uh, Bobby, Bobby Breslau, who did bags for him? And, right. And, Very. Um, I think that, you and know, Joe Eula's right. relationship. Right. When you had Joe, you had Elsa Peretti. Uh, you know, Warhol was always around. I mean, he always had very creative people around. And it really was, it was but terrific. But he gave people like Elsa credit. I mean, yes, he didn't he did. take sure. the credit for, for that, right. which other designers tend to do in those situations. Right, right. He absolutely did. And he loved Joe. I mean, Joe was really a creative guy. You know, the other thing that he did, which I think was very important, is that he sort of bypassed the stores, which is the first time a designer did that. Uh, he, 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 he found his customer, who was a big time person that was seen on television all the time, or seen, and that became his, strong, his strongest suit. Uh, the stores had to buy him because he was out there with all the people. That didn't happen before him, that I can remember. Most of the designers really wanted to be in the stores, they wanted to be sold, they wanted to be anonymous. He had the kind of personality that was bigger than life. We have a lot of them now. We didn't have many of them then. Uh, and again, I go back to the fact that I remember it was a five-year period when designers started to make big bucks. And that changed the way everything worked on 7th Avenue. They used to make good money, but now they made big bucks. And they became celebrities. And they became celebrities, yes. Yes. His store on 68th Street, I live on 68th Street. I, re I remember that store so well. It was beautiful. It's where Max Mara is now, if any right. of you right. want to pinpoint that corner on Madison Avenue. Those windows were just... Windows were incredible. Well, it was, the year of, it was the windows when they were doing that. Bob Curry was doing Bendel's. Candy Pratt's was doing right. Charles Jordan. Windows were an art form in New York. You'd go around New That's York right. to see the windows that these designers right. were doing. Right. Joel, they look at Joel. Also, Joel Schumacher I mean, started it at right. Bendel's. Right. And it was great to see Joel. Robert Curry. Robert Who Curry, said that? I said Robert. Oh, my God. And Gene Moore. Gene, Gene, well, Moore. Gene Moore. But the big fashion windows really told We have. Told don't we have Dick stories. Cubaner out there somewhere? Who? Um, you said, is Dick Cubaner still here? Oh, did he leave? He oh. might have left. I'm sorry. Okay, how, how many of you in the audience knew Halston? Oh my, let's see. Knew him, knew him well. I know Ellen Salzman's back there. Ellen? Ellen? Do, do we have a mic oh, that we could pass around? Uh, oh my God, Ellen's here. <laughs> it's coming in. Here's a mic. Oh my God, Keisha was your secretary. Yes. Ellen <laughs> Salzman used to be the fashion director at Saks Fifth yeah. Avenue and she's a fashion legend. Yeah. Truly a legend. Uh, I was working at Saks. Halston and Saks never used designer names. Halston was the first designer name really? to be used. Really? Right, right. That's, that's, that's which, a landmark. Which was a landmark thing. Did you like working with him? I never really worked with him that closely. And I don't think he wanted to work with me that closely. <laughs> Quite honestly. <laughs> But he was okay. tough. He was a tough guy. He was a tough guy. Yeah. But it's true that that Sachs, at one point they said, "Oh, they don't want Sachs label. They want Halston. They want a name. They want That's a fashion." True. Right. That's true. Right. And then when when the pennies thing happened, we dropped them. You dropped you them did. also. You dropped them. Yeah. Everybody dropped them. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. so a lesson there. Okay. Can I ask you a question? We never dropped Mr. Moore. 
Can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. In regards to, you know, there's so many people that say, oh, Ultra Suede made Holston, or this made Holston, or that made Holston, and I say that his, his vision made Halston. He was Halston before he became famous, before Studio 54, and before he was um, really in the newspapers all the time. And I just, from a fashion director, and I have great respect for you, I remember those years, I like your take. I like your take on that. On. Do you know what I'm at? You I, know? Th I think Halston's designs made Halston. Right. I, right. I, I don't think it was the ultra suede thing. The right. ultra suede certainly helped. Right. It was his designs. Right. And the cast of characters he dressed. Right, no doubt about it. Yeah. Right. Liza helped a lot. Right. Liza helped a lot, of course. Right. If Halston hadn't died of AIDS, what do you think would have come of him and his career? I'm not going to project that. I would hope that he would have, I hope that the, the AIDS, the, the, the the drugs would have dissipated and he would have found himself again, but I, I doubt it. I, I think the arc was there. The arc, it, it just seemed to be self-destructive for the last 10 years of his life. A lot taken out. I even got a call, believe it or not, from Mr. Hugo, uh, Victor. Victor Hugo. Yeah, years after what? Uh, asking me to go out. <laughs> Which is, this is true. And, and now that's a story I haven't heard from you. I know, it's true. <laughs> and I thought I heard all his stories. It's true. It's Ghost Dan, right? Um, I, 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 again, I, I, it's such a wonderful thing to see true talent shown as well as it was tonight in this film. It makes me, as a designer, proud to be a designer. Because we're quirky, we're, I mean, I've been doing it for seven decades or six decades, and it's a tricky world. Fern knows it better than anybody. We, the egos of designers are so fragile, they're so, uh, that you wonder how they get through it all, unless they're protected, uh, unless, they, unless their talent is so rich, or their talent is so smart. This was a lesson tonight. This film was a lesson for me. I hope it was for a lot of the other people. Yeah, designers are probably some of the most insecure people in the world. Unbelievable. Um, some of the other people who um, worked on New Halston, a, a brief story. Miss, go have the mic back. Who's yes. there? My name is Gail. Hi, Gail. Hello, Gail. Hi. Get the mic. Halston. Oops. I worked for Halston from 1973 to, I think 1980, 1979, something at that time, I worked on 7th Avenue. I was a little disappointed that nothing was really mentioned about the people who traveled all over the country selling his clothes and who sold the clothes to the buyers in the department stores oh. and the specialty stores. It would have been nice if they had mentioned something like that. So it, w it would have been nice, but it's about him. The movie's <laughs> about him. Right. Don had a big part in the Don Freeze, you yes, know, yes. had a big. But he came after a couple of other people that were there before him. Right, I know that. I know that. Okay. Jerry. Um, who else? I know I have a friend here, Brett, who Brett. went up for a job and interviewed there. Wait, can we have the mic? I was about 20, and Ellen Salzman sent me for an interview at Halston. And do you remember that? You recommended me. I did? Yeah. <laughs> and did you get the job? No, I got downstairs. I went to the payphone. I called the killer mother. She said, how did it go? And I said, it'll, now never, wor it'll never work me working there. And they said, she said, why? said, because they said I had to wear all black and only speak when I was spoken to. <laughs> and she said, you better call Ellen and tell her that. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I think I was a jerk. I should have gone and been quiet for three years. <laughs> Wouldn't have happened. No, no. Wouldn't have happened. Anybody else want to share a Halston story? That's good. Okay. Did anybody have questions? Some questions for Fred or Stan or myself? Yeah. It's not my industry, but I have a question. In today's world, microphone. In today's world, would it have been easier if Halton became sober to start a new collection, minimal minimalism by Halston, 
or was that contract for life that he could never? He didn't own his name. It, it, well, and you know, they're shockingly how many designers lost their name that way. I don't know how it happened. And still are and still, still losing do. them. Still, still losing Ralph, them. Ralph Ritchie lost her name sold forever. his name to an investor. Who? Ralph Ritchie. Yeah, it's the most recent one. Tracy Reese. Tracy Reese. Tracy Reese. Reese. My dear friend Tracy Reese. I don't know how it happened. She doesn't own her name anymore. It's ridiculous. Joseph Abood. Norma did has her time. name. Norma has her name. Who, 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 Joseph Abood. Joseph Abood got his name back. He got it back. He got his for name a long back. time. He didn't right. have it. Right. He paid for it. He paid for it. Big, big time. And also, didn't um, Harvey Weinstein bought Halston for a while? He did. Owned that. And he was did. Trying to get his yeah. wife and other people to design it. Right. Yes. This. I have a question regarding uh, the licensing. So I watched uh, with great intent was very keen on, on sort of acquiring uh, a lot of license. It took me back to Pierre Cardin. Was there some, was that an inspiration in terms of cash, income? It's the only way designers stayed in business. Cardin was the genius of them all. He has like 117 licenses today. He's still working in Paris in the age of like 99. And if you, if you go back in history and look at all the great designers, like Jeffrey Bean, who didn't license his name enough, so his name has been lost. Bill Blass, who was the greatest licensor when he started, there has none of them left. Licensing was the way designers became important, especially with perfume. <laughs> the perfume did. The perfume led the way for most of the designers, and also led the way for their expansion into Europe and right. all the other countries. It was the fragrance that came first. And um, Jeffrey, yes. What? This is Jeffrey Banks, who we keep referring to in the front row. <laughs> I was just going to say that, you know, Michael Lichtenstein, who is an amazing lawyer the sweetest and, man. and a great business person, he's the one that, you know, helped uh, Halston get into licensing. And most of the licenses that Michael uh, instituted were terrific licenses. I mean, you know, the luggage license that, that Halston had. The fragrance license that, that, that you mentioned, the big problem was that Halston did not want to delegate, you know, and he wanted to be involved in every single detail. And that's almost an impossibility when you have a business that yeah. that is that big. Well, well Cal that's Calvin's true. business grew because of the the underwear license with oh, oh, Wachner yeah. and the jeans and license. The jeans with Pure. But he managed to keep a certain Serious control over the creative of all of that. Right. But he also yeah, had right. Barry. He had yeah, Barry. exactly. He had he a had good Barry. partner. And Halston never had that. Never but, had a Barry. But with Halston, the, the you know the problem was that he couldn't delegate, and and Mike didn't know how. Michael Lichtenstein didn't know how to sort of Could figure you know. this out. A story, as I said, I got involved in a lot of projects. At one point, they gave me the position of design assistant to follow all the men's licensees. Part of the part of the funny part of that story is there was all, there was Halston and there was the assistance room and there were four or five people, Dee Dee and Bill Dugan and whatever. And I said, that's fine, thank you, this is great. But if you put me in the assistance room, I quit. So he had a little office off of his office. It was basically the size of a closet. But I said, I'll take it. That's my office. So, but getting back to the part of the licensee, they had already started with Shoneman, oh. Jay Shoneman, a men's sportswear. Barry Wishnow was the president. And they started to create a men's sportswear line. So Mike said, they want, we have a date to present it in three weeks. Go over there and take a look. I went over and looked. I came back and I said, Mike, it's a disaster. Halston will hate it. You know, I, I don't know what you can do, but he is not going to be happy. Well, there's nothing we can do, blah, blah, blah. Three weeks later, we have the meeting, and of course, Halston, this is not what I want. This is not Halston. To go over to the, uh, Andre Oliver had that wonderful store on 57th Street. Go over there. All the cashmere sweaters. Right, or the 12 or 15 color corduroy pants. Up, yeah. was, they were beautiful. <laughs> That's what he wanted, which makes perfect sense. But nobody was in control. Halston didn't follow up. Mike didn't really know how to do it. I have to say, I've always said this, 
Europe really knows how to sort of pull everything together. America doesn't. I mean, Ralph Lauren's done it great, but it's Ralph Lauren. Calvin did it great, but yes, right. But you know, generally, if you, if you don't have a partner or if you don't have the vision, it's just not well done in America, unfortunately. And business, business, designer business can't be small anymore. If you can't have a lovely Norell business, you can't have a lovely Jimmy Gallinos business or a Pauline right. Trujillo business, you have to be the biggest big business. And that's why Michael Kors went through the difficulty he went through until he finally leveled off. That's why Tory Burch is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You can't stay small and be a big design business anymore. Yeah. It just doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't and work. so you ask the question, I don't know who, how these kids do it today, how they start. First of all, they get a jump ahead of everybody and then it's all catch up, catch up. Everybody's biting their ass. They're, they don't know where to go with it. It's a tough time now. And there's you have to be big business. Yeah, there's some names out there that some of the uh, big publishers are pushing, but it's, it's some of them are not going anywhere no, no. because they just. No. They There's can't. a lot of designers in purgatory right now. Right. They're Absolutely. in this middle right. ground. Right. They can't get bigger. They don't can't get the funding they need. They can't and I get don't know if there's. Out. You know, I always wonder: is there the interest out there for? designers today. It's a whole different, if it's a bloggers and a stylist. If you walk on Madison Avenue, there's more empty stores than there right. are occupied ones. So it's it a whole different, for the business has changed but, so drastically. It's, it's also a badge of honor for some of these designers to sell Costco. Because a Costco comes in and buys 250,000 units of their name. Whereas Saks buys Sorry Ellen, they buy four pieces. Uh, I remember Donna Karen going down to QVC. Uh, and uh, we, I got her got down there because she uh, we were doing the, the AIDS uh, T-shirt, and she went on and she sold ten T-shirts. I mean, she sold uh, ten thousand T-shirts in four minutes. And she came into <laughs> she the she came into the she came. In, what am I selling sacks for? What is this? This is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> It's kind of true. Um, I, mean, so I just want to say uh, also that when somebody mentioned about Pierre Cardin, there's a huge exhibition of his opening up in the Brooklyn Museum. I think next week it starts, or the week after. We have one final question back here. We can only have time for one more. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been informed that this is a really good oh. final question. So oh, it's from, Ivan, oh, from Hi. Ivan Bart. Ivan. Hello. The head of it's IMG for all fashion. three of you. <laughs> I want to know, um, since you all like the film, what uh, each one of you? Which what was what would you say the takeaway, or what you liked about it most, or what you would recommend people to see this film? Firm. Well, I, I think it's a lesson in, in the fashion business about owning your name, doing the right thing, surrounding yourself with the right smart people. Um, you know, I I tell young designers when I meet them early on. Get a lawyer before you need one. Get one now so that you don't have to pay a lot of money when you make a mistake. Um, but I think there's a, I think there are a lot of lessons in that yeah, in that movie. I do too. Um, you know, for me, it was a personal journey also through so much of that that I knew. I, I kind of think the same. I think that it's uh, the, the business aspect of selling your name and, and who you're selling, who you're who you're in bed with, you know, who are your partners and, how, and, you know, do you trust them and are they, and things could go wrong with the, with Norton Simon and uh, David Mahoney trying to buy the business and then Holston would have been fine in a way. And then all of a sudden Esmore comes in and swoops it up and then you're, you're all of a sudden in another country, you're, you're, you're lost. So that's a big part of it. It also shows the 1970s. It shows that period in, in, a, in a whole different fashion industry. And I think that that's fascinating as well. So I, I you know. Well, both those times have changed. I mean, the magazines back then spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on shoots. The extravagance of right. the photo, you know, the editorial shoots, all of that's gone now. The, none yeah. of that money exists yeah. anymore. Yeah. All those editors have town cars going everywhere, every expense paid for, every meal, every trip. Right. No more. That's it's a different world then. Different world. Different world. I I I mean, I for me, um, having been around as long as I have, the most extraordinary thing about a film like this is the profound simplicity of it. How how life is the same whether you're in the fashion business, whether you're in the art world, whether you're in an investment banker. There are the good guys. There are the bad guys. The ones who are talented. The ones who are not so talented. And when a person does a good film, he gets all that going. And for me, the profundity of the film 
elevated our industry to the reality of, I think, art. That was my take on it. I, I have to just one last question. Is there, anybody, is there anybody today that you think is a Holston designer? I can tell designer. you some who think they are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> I, you I, mean, know, I think the row is the closest to Holston. Of, well, they look like Holston, right, exactly. But they, you know, Holston truly did change fashion. I mean, the concept of fashion. You know, look, one day on the front page of Women's Wear Daily, there was a, a, a very simple, beautiful suit, and they said, this suit is, you know, this is for the first woman president. That's what he saw. That's what he saw. You know, women, years ago, women were an accessory to men, unfortunately. I mean, that's the world of years ago. Today, you know, women and men are equal, let's hope. And they're wearing the same clothes now. And, right, it's and wearing, and, and you know, you have to wear clothes to work. You have to wear clothes here, there. Your lifestyle is all different. You know, it's completely different. And that's what he saw. And that's what he presented. And I think that fashion changed from those yeah. times. People do beautiful collections and they're interesting. And, but that was a, a vision of where we are. Give it a very few to have, very few. You know, for me, the, the, one of the most profound things was in the, in the film when he pointed out the crease in Jackie's hat. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And to me, that was, you try perfection and somebody knocks that perfection and that perfection becomes your signature. You're in trouble, baby. You're in trouble. True. Well, well a quickie, what? What do you think he was thinking going to China? Uh, Publicity, business. Yeah, I really think PR. that it was PR. It's all PR. I think it well, was and PR. technically, it was a PR fabric. machine. That was advanced too. That it was, was really way ahead of everybody. I mean, going to China. Oh, we, we, yep. Okay. I think that that's yeah, it. I Thank you all thing. very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>